Hello and welcome back to the Practical Family Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Bryant, and you are watching episode 96, How to Talk with Your Kids About Race. This is part two of a two-part series, and my special guest today is Dr. Lucretia Carter-Berry, author of the book, What Lies Between Us, and teacher at brownicity.com. We are continuing our conversation from last time in this second part. And in this part, we'll talk about the concepts of education and how when we are educated about things we did not know before, that could lead to special revelation in our lives that'll then lead to transformation. And the transformation that we want to make sure that happens in our hearts is the ability to see race and people as God sees them. So we'll take the spiritual element of things and then talk about the neuroscientific development of our brains as we learn how to take in new information and then what we do with that and what that looks like in our everyday life. Dr. Berry will talk with us about how we use that truth or the new truth that we come to understand to overwrite the old lies in our life. And don't we need to do that all the time, mamas? Don't we need to search our hearts and think about how we've been thinking about things? Because I use the example even in my own marriage, sometimes we need to work on our educational components as husband and wife in order to think differently about each other, about our circumstances, and grow in grace and love. The same thing happens when we're faced to look at our internal bias when it comes to race, culture, culture clashes, things that change in our lives that make us look differently at things depending on how we learned about it as kids and how we need to look at it now as adults raising kids, raising the next generation. And finally, at the end of this episode, Dr. Barry will answer one of the questions submitted by a member of our practical family community. So stay tuned until the end. If you're listening to this while you're doing chores or driving or just taking care of things around the house, make sure that you're catching both part one and part two. You can also check out the notes in our description here if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on iTunes, you can click on any of the resources we've mentioned in this episode in the show notes or on our blog page at practicalfamily.org. So here we go, part two of my conversation with Dr. Lucretia Carter Berry about how to talk with your kids about race. Do it. And you cited Romans 12, 2 in your curriculum as well. You, you cite a lot of scripture, which is, is refreshing because it's, it's the practice of continually coming back to the heart of God. And at the end of the day, I mean, however we are physically identifying or culturally identifying, if we claim to be Christians, then we, we have that. The Lord has set us free of these things. And we also have the freedom to learn and to change, which is what I love that you, you settled on. So just as a reminder, Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. <laughs> That's powerful right there for a lot of different uh, reasons and even personal applications. Um, but tell us how this biblical truth can translate into how we can position ourselves in the conversation about race. Ooh, I don't know if we have time for that. That's a big one. <laughs> you know what? I've already decided to split this into two parts because this okay. is a conversation. <laughs> so go long. You can go long. You're fine. Transformation. Um, I, so that for me, you know, that was where it started. I, I say, I got the education and the education gave me capacity to get the revelation that fostered transformation. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, I always like go to the butterfly, right? You know, like, so you're, the caterpillar is already born with the capacity to be a, a butter, butterfly, it has all the parts of the but butterfly inside the caterpillar. And then it goes into the chrysalis and experiences a true metamorphosis or metanoia, like it transforms. And so it has to lose some things in order to become something different, right? And, you know, it's, we are so ingrained as humans, like we want to belong, like we want to belong to a group, you know, and 
maybe you, you know, that's where you find the crux of your identity. We, we have to be able to um, ask ourselves and examine how much we're being informed by man-made ideologies versus our, you know, true um, divine essence. You know, so going back to the caterpillar, like caterpillar, you are, you are, you always had the capacity to be a butterfly, but you had to lose, you had to go through some things, you had to lose some things in order to become the butterfly. Um, but what if you said, nope, um, you know, I have it, it was determined that I would be a caterpillar, and so I remain, I will remain, you know, crawling on the ground forever. I don't know. We have to be able to see how much we are more informed by man-made ideas um, than we are by, you know, God's design, God's heartbeat. And really, it just came from my own journey um, of, you know, having a, I call it like, uh, you know, having a God conversations are hard, you know, or God conversations are, you know, it's this kind of smack in the face, um, this God moment where God was, you know, asking me kind of a who am I question. And so, you know, am I more, am I being more informed by um, this narrative of race or, um, or these narratives about who we are? Or what, am I willing to see God, how God has, uh, God's design for, for who I am? And that requires a lot of movement um, and a lot of, you know, losing things and coming out of things in order to expand into, um, into something, I would say something more beautiful, something more inclusive um, and all encompassing of God's dream for humanity. Amen. Amen. That spiritual transformation also gives way to knowing and believing that God has made our brains to learn and to grow in certain ways. And, and you talk about this idea of neuroplasticity. <laughs> neuroplasticity. <laughs> Basically that our brains have the ability absolutely to change direction and beliefs. So I've been thinking a lot about this lately, like even in my own marriage, how my, my husband and I have been married for 14 years and we're still constantly always working on communication in our marriage. Right. Um, I've had to learn how not to be so defensive against him when he's, he's got different ideas about things or different ways to approach things. And we both have different sort of emotional capacities, let's say. Um, but I have to remind myself that even when we disagree, look, my, my spouse is not against me. He's, he's, we're united. He's my partner in this life. Um, and what helps us is to really take the time to listen to each other. So it's not unlike this whole situation around race. Like if we take the time to truly listen to each other's sides, we grow in empathy, we grow in love, and we're a lot less defensive. So talk to us about how neuroplasticity can help us <laughs> in, this, in this conversation too. Well, I love how, yeah, this question comes right after Romans 12 and 2 because neuroplasticity um, aligns with Romans 12 and 2. And I actually was inspired again by Dr. Caroline Reef, who, you know, made that connection for me in her book. Like, it's the same thing <laughs> that, um, you know, we were designed for, for transformation or we were designed, of course, to grow um, and evolve. And sometimes people think, well, you know, I was raised a certain way, or this is how, you know, this, this is how I was taught all my life. Well, uh, you know, neurons, this is what I've heard, neurons that fire together, wire together. So we have the capacity as neuroplasticians, um, unlike other animals, or, you know, be, yes, anyway, <laughs> to step out. <laughs> I was about to go down a whole path there. That's okay. Back <laughs> I'm like every created being. Sure, I get it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We have the capacity to see how we think. So, you know, we can like step outside of our brains and see how we're thinking. We're not just thinking, but we can see how we're thinking. And so if we can look critically at how we're thinking. Then we are able to, um, you know, do some rewiring there. And that's a large part of healing. Um, whether it be you know racial or like me with um, unforgiveness, having to kind of tell a different story and connect 
truths and overwrite lies with truths. Um, it's, it's possible. And then again, um, if, you, if you don't understand neuroplasticity, then maybe you understand Romans 12 and 2. <laughs> that we, we, yeah, we have the capacity um, to trans to transform. We don't have to be like a product of an environment. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's encouraging. And now, now, as we move forward, as we think about what it's going to look like for each of our families to move forward, to, to start doing things differently. I like how you described how, how your husband is being proactive in, in anti-racism in his workplace. How do we begin to create safe spaces for talking about race from people with different backgrounds when these multi-ethnic um, uh, crowds are not our own? You know, how, how can we start to work on this together as a family? Okay, so a few things. I don't think that you have to be in a multi-ethnic environment to start the conversations. So sometimes um, you're not doing this, but I've heard people say, well, you know, I live in a white bubble and everyone around me is white. So I don't need to learn or know anything or have the capacity um, to talk to people that are different than I do. And again, that's a, you know, that's a resistance to growth. Um, and that's very fear-based. That's a very fear-based response. And then you, okay, and then of course, it's also a historical and um, again, you know, we have been sh sorted on purpose. So we don't, we didn't naturally kind of gravitate into different neighborhoods. It was all very much, um, you know, policy making of the U.S. government. Um, and so when you know that, you know, you can go, oh, well, you know, if the U.S. government had not sorted us into these you know, bubbles and things like that, you know, where, where, where might I be, you know, living, who might be my friends? And, and we do make these assumptions that someone who looks like me is, um, is very similar um, to me. And so how many people do you know that are like you or look like you, but they are not <laughs> similar to you at, you know, at all, like my husband and I, we are so different. Um, we look different, of course, and we have so, so such great different backgrounds and I think you know sometimes I just love that the most about us like the things that I am not good at he is excellent at you know and vice versa so the whole difference thing and coming into relationships with people who are different than us should not be scary because um, people who look different than you could just have the same heart that you have or be passionate about the same things that you do it's just that being racialized has told us not to give, you know, not to give this relationship or potential friendship a chance because people look different um, than we do. Um, but to that, so let's just say, um, you know, if you're in a homogeneous group, you know, I get this a lot. People say, well, you know, um, I've been reached out to by people who say, well, I live in a white bubble. That's fine. Start in your white bubble. Like start your white bubble with, um, you can bring things into your bubble, <laughs> like, you know, media and books and things like that. So you can, you know, even within your own home, um, you know, provide a window to, you know, look beyond and experience beyond, you know, the white bubble. You, you can do that. Um, but then you could also do, um, this is what someone did with me. Um, when we lived in Iowa and she was very intentional, like she, you know, did want to have a friendship with me because she noticed that her children were learning negative messages in, in the school about African-Americans because of how the teacher treated an African-American student. And she, so she, and so at first though, I will say, so if you're going to be intentional in trying to cultivate a friendship, you know, you do want that to be genuine, Right. So she didn't just say, hey, walk up to me. Hey, black lady, <laughs> come be my friend. Um, uh, you know, it's, we, we, were, we got to know each other in classes. Like we were in courses together and then, um, and we developed a friendship. So I would say, um, you know, it's always better to, just to develop friendships. And then you, you have a foundation to do uh, more challenging conversations. Um, I would, I don't recommend now some people do like to do this kind of thing but i don't recommend you know kind of getting strangers together just because we're different you know mm -hmm. and then have kind of complicated nuanced conversations i think that's really dangerous and you know trauma specialists are saying that it, it 
a lot of those things are further traumatizing people. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of my favorite podcasts is a first name basis podcast. And her whole premise is, you know, develop a friendship, get on a first name basis, you know, and then um, that gives you the footing and, you know, to be able to have some harder or deeper conversations because you have a relationship there and you care. Right. Right. That that's, I'm glad that you described what that could look like because I think there has been a fear um, even in myself of, of, I'm always afraid of not coming across genuine because I truly honestly care about people and I don't want to reach out to someone just for the sake of having a, you know, a token black friend. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And because it feels super ingenuine. I wouldn't want someone to do that to me. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions, but it's like, it, it, what I'm recognizing too, is that it doesn't need to be forced because of the urgency that one might feel about, Oh, I've, I've got to write this wrong right now. Like today, you know, instead of letting a relationship grow over time. And I have been, I've been quick to, to ask people questions. I've been quick to, you know, um, assume that they're always going to want to, or be ready to answer my questions too. And, and that's, that's been a big part of my journey even lately is like how much, um, have I actually been educating myself and looking into things myself and just, and just listening. I mean, it's not like we don't have this thing called the internet and Google and YouTube and, and praying. What I have found is that even when I was praying for things like just friendships, just God bring, bring wonderful, godly women into my life to help to mentor me or help to, you know, whatever. I need friends. I don't feel like I have friends right now because I'm a mom, a new mom with babies and I can't get out anymore, you know. In the same way, it feels like we can pray for, for the Lord to, to, to teach us through people and it doesn't need to happen overnight and it's, and it's fine and just start praying for those relationships to, to develop. Because sometimes we're not ready for the friend that's different than us, you know? Mm -hmm. So I love that. Like pray for, you know, pray for some education. And I would say, you know, maybe five years ago, it would be challenging to find education. Um, but there is so now, you know, there is so much good stuff there, you know, with my, background in education, I felt like, well, all of the good stuff is in academe. Like it's just behind the walls. Yeah. Of academe. And so I've tried to be that bridge between, you know, academe and then, you know, outside of the gates where, um, you know, let's, let's bring this out here for everybody um, to, to access. Um, but uh, yeah, I love that. Like if you pray for education, then, yeah, you, there are lots of resources now, and um, and then that could prepare you for, you know, friendship. Just like with, sometimes I, when I was single, and you know, it's like, oh, you pray for your husband, or you know, you want your husband, and it's like, well, maybe you're not ready for that right now. Like maybe there's some stuff you need to do. That's <laughs> a great know. point. <laughs> great. I think it's a little extreme, though. Well, you know, and again, um, I have. Uh, like she's a white friend and she intentionally enrolls her kids and she enrolls herself in extracurricular activities where as white people, they are the uh, racial minority. Mm. She does it on purpose. Yeah. Mm. And, and that feels like a very brave thing to do. Um, I, I don't, and I don't know why it even, I, I probably sound even ignorant when I say things like that, but just like, it, it's always brave to do something that, that goes against what may feel naturally comfortable for someone. <clears throat> and counter yeah, <laughs> countercultural. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, even in growing up in Southern California, I grew up in a mostly Hispanic community. I'm half Hispanic myself. And I, I still always kind of felt like not part of the crowd because I didn't look or practice like, you know, whatever. And uh, then I moved to Hawaii and an another huge culture clash. And then, you know, white folks out here are more of the minority. But it is, it is a mentality shift for sure. And now that I have multi-ethnic kids, I'm wondering, okay, should I put them in Japanese class? Should I teach them hula? Like what, what are all the, all the different things we have to choose from here right. is, is available to me. I just need to choose that, you know. Right. But what I tend to lean toward is what I'm more comfortable with, which is what I know, and it doesn't end up 
just happening. So there is absolutely a level of intentionality there. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so, okay, this last question, and we're going to end with this. This last question comes from a mama in our practical family community, and I thought it was a great question. Um, she says, I would love to know when and how to start these conversations with littles, like young kids. My son is six, and most of his friends are either biracial or African-American, and I don't want to see his light dim when I tell him that some people wouldn't like his friends because of how dark their skin is. So she says, I don't want to have to tell him that he needs to be watching all the time when they're playing because he's going to have to step up and protect his friends if something happens because it's not safe for them to do so themselves. I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> she says, I don't want to have those conversations, but I know I will need to and I'm scared to sow seeds of something there too early and make him see them differently. I thought, wow, that, that kind of reminds me of the question, like, how early should I talk to my kids about sex or the sexual issue, which we've addressed a lot on, on Practical Family. Like, I don't want to expose them to negativity too early. But how, how would you advise this mama in this way? Well, mama, I would say that we'll research, now all children are different, but, you know, and we're all different, but research would say that he already knows the difference. So, um you know, we have by five years old, children see race as a major point of difference or distinction, um, even when it's not discussed. So even if there's been no discussions about it, he's, your child has already observed um, what has been happening um, in, the, in the world or how, like he's re already received tons of messaging about um, skin tone and race. And, you know, there is a hierarchy and people get treated differently. Um, he just hasn't maybe been given those words. And I mean, if he's in a true friendship, which sounds like he is, I would imagine that, yes, he is going to um, defend his friends. But yes, you probably want to get out in front of that because what you don't want to happen is to him for him to experience shock at his friend being treated differently um, than, than he is. And so... Um, again, it's very similar to the sex conversation. Do you want to wait till they have sex to then have the sex conversation? No, you want to get out in front of that and, and prepare them. And, you know, you have to re remember that I can't, again, I can't like make such a general statement, but I'll just use me. How about that? I'll use me as an example. Um, growing up, um, African-American my parents had to already give me the tools to navigate how white people would see me or how white people would miss see me, you know, misperceive me just because um, of my brown skin. And, you know, I've said that to people, I've said that to white people, and then they've said to me, oh, poor you, like your mother or your parents should not have told you those things. Mm -hmm. Like that. No, that saved my life because otherwise I would have thought, I would have internalized um, some type of, I would have taken it personally. Like, oh, I'm being treated this way or this thing is happening to me because of me personally. But because my parents gave me the messaging, the counter narratives, and they prepared me, and some of the stuff they shared with me, I thought, no way is that going to happen. And everything happened that they said, you know. Wow. And so then I could see it as, not white people, like individual people, but, oh, this is a, a conditioning um, that white people have undergone. And this is why they think or believe that way. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't this way of discounting or dehumanizing white people. The point was for me to be able, when things came my way, for me to be able to identify it mm. and not internalize it as something that belonged to me. Like, mm, that's, that's a them thing. That's what they do. That's not something that, you know, has any bearing on who you are um, as a person, as an image bearer of God. So again, you know, I talk about my white friend with her super white family, she says, because they're very pale. So she says they're super white. <laughs> who then does, he teaches her sons, like, well, when you're riding bicycles in our, you know, middle-class neighborhood with 
the black friends from the next neighborhood that isn't so middle class, you need to make sure that you stay with them, you know, at all times or don't don't let them ride by themselves because probably in this neighborhood, they might be misconstrued or misunderstood. So she does teach them that and she teaches her ch children, but don't traumatize your friend with that information. You see? <laughs> And it's, again, kids, fairness is so important to kids. And so, you know, when you start that conversation young, and again, it takes for parents, we need to just, we need to equip ourselves as much as possible so that you can, you know, know what to say to your child, you know, when your child needs that, you know, we, you know, your child doesn't need to like drink from a fire hose or anything like that. We don't have to like overwhelm them. Or, you know, sometimes in our home, my child will ask me a question, I'll answer the question, and she shrugs and goes back to playing. Like, we just talked about the weather, you know, and I just gave her some statistics. Well, statistically speaking, blah, 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 blah. So I just contextualized this whole thing for her, and she goes, okay, and moves on, you know? She didn't need any more. She didn't need to, like, let's have some feelings about that, you know? That was what she needed, and then she, she moves on. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so again, as parents, we've just been, we grew up, you know, with the colorblind approach. And so we really have to kind of fill in our gaps, right? And at the same time, so we have to do double duty, like fill in our gaps and give our children more than what we were given. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, that's so good, Lucretia. Thank you for being willing to sit with me today for uh, educating and, and informing us, but with such a uh, such a layer of grace and understanding, I mean, th that we also need to have for ourselves, no matter how we're looking at this. And, and, you know, you talked at the end a little bit about just, you know, your own experience, even as your parents told you this would happen to you, you, you didn't think, no, right. but it did. And that your personal experience with that, no one can argue with that. And I think um, others from, from other ethnicities, and are those who are, are lighter, who don't undergo as much discrimination, we need to be willing to listen to those stories, you know, because we, as much as we want to believe in an ideal world where everyone's equal, we want to believe that that is happening. The truth is, is that we still live in a fallen and broken world and we interact with fallen and broken people. And all we can do is work toward being a little less broken ourselves. And, um, and we can move forward in the hope that we can create the world we want. Because I know we want the, you know, the world where everybody is treated, you know, fairly and beautifully and is acknowledged, you know, as the divine creation. And, um, but we get there by cultivating it, right? You can't harvest seeds that we, we haven't planted. So we just have to plant more seeds. <laughs> You've been watching episode 96 of the Practical Family Podcast right here on YouTube, our YouTube channel for practicalfamily.org. And today we've been talking about how to talk with your kids about race. My special guest today has been Dr. Lucretia Carter-Berry with brownicity.com and author of What Lies Between Us, The Journal and Guide and Fostering First Steps Toward Racial Healing. The rest of her curriculum can be found at her website at brownnicity.com. You can find more of Lucretia's curriculum resources there at brownnicity.com and check out what she and her husband Nathan have been able to do together to educate a new community and a new generation toward racial healing. I want to thank you for joining me today. Please subscribe here on YouTube. If you have not already, then you get to see the new videos that we produce here at Practical Family. If you're listening on iTunes, please take a second to go and rate us right there on iTunes so that other people know that we're there and they can follow us as well. Thank you so much for your time. This has been Jennifer Bryant with the Practical Family Podcast, where we are strengthening moms for real life struggles, helping you to discover your gifts and embrace grace.